7 of Path of the Just. And uh, we will try to get through Chapter 7. I think we can get through it. Yes, we shouldn't have any problem. Then, then Ira Michelson will pick up on Chapter 8 next Thursday. Really excited about him coming. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, right. The, um, the last class we talked about the traits or the trait of Zerizus, Zerizus in a, uh, is essential for the performance of mitzvah. Now we decided or determined uh, from Ramchal that the difference between Zerizus and Zerus is one is the zeal and Zerus is the watchfulness, correct? So the watchfulness must come before the zeal. Zeal without watchfulness can produce carelessness or mistakes. So once we know what Zerizus is, and that is it is, um, it is essential for the performance of the mitzvahs because it requires it, it's, it's zeal. Without a deep desire and a zeal to do the mitzvahs, it's really not going to materialize, right? Uh, without Zerizus, one's natural laziness will cause him to act sluggishly. If at all, he will end up squandering many opportunities for mitzvahs. Without Zerizus, the natural inclination to laziness will grow ever stronger, not only impeding one's spiritual growth, but causing progressive spiritual decay and run as well. Rabbi Zalman Weiss said the other day um, that our spirituality is like being on an escalator and you're walking the opposite way. If you, if you don't, um, if you're staying still, you're going back, okay? And if you're moving forward at least a little bit, one step at a time, you're going one step higher. But it, there's no such thing as a static relationship with Hashem. You can't be static in your mitzvahs. You either are doing them or you're falling back, right? Zerizus is what enables a person to overcome this debilitating malice of laziness and inertia. The way to acquire this trait so essential to our spiritual growth, health and growth uh, will be explored in this next chapter, which is chapter 7. There are two elements of Zerizus, Zerizus one that applies before the deed is begun and one that applies after or during its performance. Uh, the Ramchal is going to explain what this means in this next chapter. Exercising Zerizus before beginning the deed means that a person should not delay in starting a mitzvah. Rather, when the time for the mitzvah arrives, or when the mitzvah and the opportunity presents itself for him, or when the idea to perform the mitzvah enters his mind, one should quickly spring into action to seize the mitzvah and to perform it. He should not allow any time to accumulate between the advent of the mitzvah opportunity and the performance, because there is no danger like this danger at this time. For consider, with each new moment that arises, a new obstacle to perform the good deed can arise. Why should we say this? In Lakuti Maharan, there's an idea that a mitzvah that is, uh, that is mature to happen, and yet it doesn't happen, allows leaven to grow. So you, you understand. So let's, what, what circumstance are we given that talks about not allowing leaven in bread? What, what holiday? Pesach. And why Pesach has this deal that you shouldn't wait for the leaven to rise? Because leaven takes time. It consumes your time and doesn't allow you time to prepare or to be zealous to do Hashem's uh, purpose. And for the Israelites in Egypt, this leaven would have kept them from being able to leave Egypt speedily. So they made the bread, they, they baked the bread, and they were prepared. This bread helped to sustain them for many, many weeks. So they had to cook a lot of bread. So they didn't have time, as, as Moshe does, he has to let, how long does bread have to rise? And two, about an hour. About an hour, and then you knead it down. And, yeah. So maybe two hours, two hours. So that's two hours of wasted time that you will not be able to complete the mitzvah. So the idea here, he says, is not only does one need to be zealous to look for the mitzvah, to hunt it down, but be zealous to do it and do it quick. 
I mean, get on it immediately. If you know the mitzvah's there, get on it and do it quick. Because if you don't, then leavening will begin to develop within the mitzvah, which this is the danger. The more leaven, the less time, the more probability that you won't complete the mitzvah or you won't do it. Here's the example. You get up in the morning. We know for the men we do Shema, right? And we say, well, I need to get up. It's really important. My phone rang. I need to answer my phone. And I'll get it after I make this phone conversation. And then after the phone conversation is over, you say, I need to go to the restroom. There's, no, there's always something, right? So ac these activities that cause us, and, and, and once again, watchfulness and Zerizus go hand in hand. So without watchfulness, meaning that I'm not guarding myself, then it isn't long before it's 1130 in the afternoon, and I haven't done Shema, I haven't done uh, uh, any other prayers, and I'm, I'm behind the power curve. I've missed the opportunity to do the mitzvah. Regardless of how much I wanted to do it, I allowed, knowing this, I allowed the lack of watchfulness of Zerus to overcome me, and I became indifferent. I lost inertia, right? So uh, the combination of Zerus and Zerus, or watchfulness and zeal, is really the engine and fuel of our mitzvah, right? And without the engine and fuel, you're, you're not going to be able to perform the, the task. A midrash illustrates this point. Regarding the truth of this matter, the sages of blessed memory alerted us in their discussion of the events preceding Shlomo's coronation as king of Israel. For David HaMelech said to Benyahu, uh, the head of the Sanhedrin, he said, take Shlomo down to uh, Gihon Spring, or the Gihon Spring, uh, and, and Zadik and the Kohen and Nisan Hanavi, or the prophet, uh, shall anoint him. And Benyahu uh, uh, responded, regarding Benyahu's response, the sages stated as follows. Uh, Rav Pinchas said, in the name of Ra, Rav uh, Hanan of, of Tzipori, that, uh, but was it not already stated in a prophecy to David? Behold, a son will be born to you. He will be a man of rest. His name will be Shlomo and shall establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Shlomo's reign was thus assured by Hashem. Why then did ben, uh, ben Neahu find necessary to beseech Hashem to fulfill David's wish? Rather, Ben Neahu said, Many accusers can arise from here. Uh, that is the people who resisted David until uh, Gihon in, to prevent Shlomo's appointment. I therefore pray that Hashem enables us to carry it out. So what does he say? And he says that he was in danger of not being able to complete the, the mitzvah, even though it was already prophesied that Shlomo was going to be able to do it. So even though we have in our mind, we know, that Hashem makes the promises that He will restore His people in the end of age. His people, the Jewish people, do not sit on their laurels and go, well, He'll restore us in the end of age. Why do we need to do any mitzvah? Mm -hmm. right? So the idea is the prophet's like, He prayed for help. So what is the answer to attempting to do the mitzvah, have zerius or zeal, is to pray that Hashem gives you the opportunity to speedily do what He asks you to do. And that is... That is the, um, that's probably the only way. And we understand that faith, uh, faith and trust in Hashem and study of Torah is really a, the elixir that we have to engage in daily that develops out this zeal in our life and watchfulness in our life. Having established the danger, I'm sorry, go ahead. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Because if you don't, if you're not in relationship, then there, there something it something becomes uh, amiss in our uh, zeal. And a prayer can make that relationship. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the strong things that we see in um, in the Brislov community is this idea of hid the right? Personal prayer. Um, 
You know, there is a debate that whether what is more important, the study of Torah, Hidda Dabut. And, you know, the sages of Brislav says prayer is more important. Why? Because prayer will ensure that you study Torah. Yeah. Because that's what you're kind of asking for. That's what you're asking for. Exactly. If you haven't engaged your neshama in this endeavor, then the intellectual pursuit of it is just going to be that. It's going to be intellectual pursuit. Because what would happen is one would study and become an academic in Torah without living the Torah and about it consuming themselves. Correct. They both go hand in hand. I mean, you know, literally we're not saying that you cannot study Torah and just do hit the debut or personal prayer. Right. The idea is that if you do hit the debut, you don't have a desire or personal prayer. You have a desire to engage in the study of Torah. So that's the deal. Uh, having established the danger of postponing a mitzvah, the Ramchal cites a spiritual allusion to this matter. Therefore, the sages of blessed memory exhort uh, and says, Scripture states that you shall safeguard the mitzvahs. Do not read the word only as mitzvahs, but rather also as mitzvah commandments. The verse that warns you shall safeguard the mitzvah, which means when the mitzvah comes to your hand, do not allow it to leaven. Do not delay, but rather begin its performance immediately. The Ramchal provides several additional resources regarding the importance of the beginning of the mitzvahs. The sages further say in, in the Gemara, um, a person should always hasten to perform the mitzvah, for because Lot's older, um, older daughter preceded his younger daughter, by one night their descendants merited to precede her, her younger sister's descendants by joining the nation of Israel by four generations. So when we look at this, we see, oh my goodness, uh, the whole idea, the reason why that we are speed, speedily doing the mitzvahs is to safeguard them. Because once they're gone, they're gone. Now, what mitzvahs are mitzvahs that, uh, that are here one moment and will not be here the next moment? There are mitzvahs that are time-bound, the Moadims, Sukkahs, right? These are time-bound mitzvahs. If you don't do them, you, pat, you miss them. For a year. For a year. Correct, for a year. And if you, if you fail to do them, then you have to go back and redo them. We, we talked about this last night in the, in the uh, study of myths and facts of creation. And, and we remembered that Cain, when he uh, was angry at his brother, Hashem came to him when he was angry because of the offerings, and it said that Hashem turned his face from uh, Cain's offering, Hashem says, why are you all gloomy and down? He says, don't you know all you have to do is correct these things? Correct them, it'll be okay. Which means that if Cain wanted to, he could have taken the finest of his crops right then, yeah. erected an altar, and presented to Hashem as an Allah, Allah offering. And he'd be, he'd be doing that mitzvah of being obedient to what Hashem Correct. said. Correct. So he would gain double the mitzvahs. Yeah. Right? Correct. Exactly. So the, his lack of his lack of Zerizus. Now, now think about it. Some would say, well, no, he had Zerizus, he had zeal because he did it. Well, the problem is, is he half did it. I'm just wondering, is that real zeal? Or did he do it out of some level of obligation? Now, interesting, interesting thing about this that I didn't mention in the last class, in the in the Torah class, <laughs> is that the difference between a hunter and a gatherer. We understand a gatherer is the agricultural guy, and a hunter is the guy who raised his animals up or whatever. Uh, somewhere in the process, Cain developed in his lifestyle uh, an inflated ego. Just follow me. His inflated ego came from his sweat of toiling in the soil, making sure the ground was watered properly, make sure it's proper fertilizer, grooming the plants, et cetera, et cetera. And so by the time the harvest came, he looked at his harvest and said, look what I did. And so when it came to time to presenting it to Hashem, it was like, well, Hashem really didn't have too much to do with this. I'm the one that worked for it. So why should I give Hashem his best? Because this doesn't actually belong to Hashem. It belongs to me. This was my mitzvah. This was my deal. I own this. Yeah, narcissism. 
Abel, on the other hand, he just feeds the cattle, they give birth, they grow, they nurse themselves, and clearly Abel can see that he didn't play any role in this besides nourishing and taking care of the animals. And so therefore he saw that without Hashem's help, I wouldn't have any of these animals. So therefore I have to give Hashem my best. It's the difference in looking at the mitzvahs. Are you looking at the mitzvahs because you're doing this because you have great prowess, prowess to do it? Or are you looking at this because you realize this is something that I, I, Hashem does needs for me to present to Him. These are offerings of mitzvah that I do to, for Hashem. It's the difference between saying, and often we see this, the very wealthy are not the people who contribute the most. It's not the wealthy. It's usually the people of meager means that contribute the most per capita. You understand what I'm saying? Now the wealthy will, for example, a multimillionaire, millions, he's making millions of dollars a month. And he, when we hear that he contributes $24 million to, uh, to the CDC for Ebola research, you think, wow, $24 million, that's huge. But when you realize he made $24 million in three, three weeks, right? it's not that much. Right, you, you think about it in that way. But you think of a poor person or a person of meager means, who hears of a Torah scroll being presented and gives $200 right off the bat, you think, my goodness, when you compare that, if the millionaires of this community or the world, the wealthy people, would give at that level of zeal, oh my goodness, can you imagine? And so you would say, well, no, he gave and that it, it helped a lot. Yes, but what Hashem is not looking at is the final result of your mitzvah, but what was your, what was your desire and goal in the mitzvah? Both gave offerings. One gave second best, the other one gave the first. First fruits. It's a huge difference. And so when we look at this, we realize that our mitzvahs, um, we have to establish a, 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 a strong sense of guarding these mitzvahs. Let me read this from... Um, uh, from from the commentary it says, if 18 minutes elapse after water is added to flour, the dough becomes chametz, simply because of that delay. In practice, matzah dough should not be left alone or unworked, even for a moment. This is the image one must keep in mind when he has the opportunity to perform the mitzvah. Just as a mitzvah is re ruined, if too much time is allowed to pass before it is baked, so, I mean, the matzah, so too a mitzvah might be ruined if so much time is allowed to pass before it's performed. Even a minor delay can make it impossible to carry it out. The Ramchal provides several additional resources regarding the importance of beginning a mitzvah immediately. A person should always hasten to perform a mitzvah for because Lot's older daughter preceded his younger daughter by one night, her, oh, I'm sorry, we, we, we already covered that, didn't we? Uh, next, Zerus during performance of, uh, Zerizus during the performance of a mitzvah. So we have three elements. One is the zeal to do, the other is the zeal while doing it, and the end is the zeal that you have after it's done. Now, it just doesn't make sense. Why? What's the importance of having zeal while you're doing it and the zeal after? And we're going to examine this. Now, with respect to the second element of Zerizus, or zeal, naming, uh, namely, Zerizus, after beginning the deed, it means that once a person has grasped the opportunity to perform a mitzvah, he should hasten to complete it. But his hasten should not come from a desire to relieve himself of the responsibility do you get that? Yes. As one who desires to cast off his burden from himself, rather his haste should result from his fear that he may not merit a complete mitzvah if, if he delays. Mm -hmm. So the idea is I see someone on the side of the street that is destitute and I feel very strongly that I've got to help them. But I say, well, let me, let me turn around in the street and I'm going to go back over there and I'm going to do the mitzvah. 
And as I'm in the process of mitzvah, I'm digging the money out of my pocket. And if I'm not careful in the delay of that, the person might walk away, I might miss the opportunity, or I might get distracted by something else and not complete it, even though my intention was to start the process. You so you, you got a phone call. Yeah, the famous phone call, right? Yeah, that's true. This, the sages stress the importance of seeing mitzvah through to completion. The sages of blessed memory frequently exhorted regarding this. For example, they say in Barashis or Rabbah in 85.3, whoever begins a mitzvah and does not complete it buries his wife and his children. They also say a mitzvah is attributed only to the one who completes it. Furthermore, Shlomo HaMelech placed uh, peace be upon, me, be upon him stated, have you seen a man with uh, a lacery uh, in his work or, or what do you call it? Uh, yeah, yeah, this quickness in his work. He will stand before kings. He will not stand uh, before dark, darkened ones. And the sages of blessed memory applied this praise to Shlomo himself for expediting the work of the building of the base Hamikdash. So the idea is, did David HaMelech receive merit for wanting to, to, to build the temple and gather the, um, the property for the temple? Yes. But who got the ultimate mitzvah? The Shlomo HaMelech. Because he built it. So... Correct. No, correct. Correct. It wasn't disobedience, even though he earned. So the whole point is, is one. Let's think of some examples. Um, um, there's a project that we can donate to to help someone specific that's poor, and you find out about it and then you promote it, and you start the project with some funds, but you just get too distracted and you can't complete it. But somebody else comes out and finds out that you had started this project, and they complete the project. Who gets the, the mitzvah credit for completing the project? The person that did it. Yeah, because Even though you started it. Right. By not doing it. Right. So the person that started it allowed leaven to come into their matzah, basically. Right? right? Okay. So they, 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 even though they started it and they had the best of intent, and, you know, they had some zeal. They weren't doing it for any other reason, but they just got distracted. This whole idea of watchfulness and, and zerizus or zeal to do something is very important. So you can actually start something and not get credit for a mitzvah. Yes, sir. Right. 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 Yes. Right. Well, remember the warning that we had just in the last last part of the chapter, our last uh, last reading. He said, a person who who does the mitzvah and says, "Look, I got to get it over with." It's like it's not a mitzvah. It's like right. It's not a mitzvah. You just did something. It was good credit. You helped your community. You, you brought credit to yourself. But in the eyes of Hashem, it was, it was more trouble than it was worth. And with your zeal, though, you should have found somebody else that could have partnered with you to finish it. Then you would have been given yeah. credit. Now, there's another idea. Right. Okay, here's the other idea. Let's say that you start into a project and you realize this is way over my head. I'm not going to be able to complete this to its fullest because... It's way beyond my ability to get it done. So I find somebody with the equal amount of zerus, or I mean, a zerizus, a zeal, mm -hmm. and, you, and they have the resource. You say, look, will you help me out? I'll be by your side, do as much as I can, but I've reached my limit, and they finish it out. You've actually accomplished that because with your watchfulness and with your own zeal, even though you realize your inabilities, somebody else came by your side. You do get credit for that. Does that make Don't sense? Wait too long. Don't wait too long. Because what will end up happening, if you wait too long, one of two things are going to happen. You won't finish it, or you'll finish it and go, whew, so glad that's over. Yeah, exactly. And we all are guilty of that, okay? So uh, I was teasing Miss Virginia, or she was teasing me the other day. And uh, 
Yeah, I'm pulling. I'm pulling you. We uh, Moshe and I went over to uh, Loretta's, and we had to move a bunch of property up to another uh, uh, third store apartment, and it wasn't. It wasn't heavy, it wasn't laborious, and it was just, it was time, and, and so I was picking on Miss Virginia, and I was saying, thank you so much for the mitzvah, you know, like, like I'm glad I had the mitzvah, but I really didn't want to do it, you know, I was, I was teasing her about it, and then as we're walking out of the door, she tests Moshe and I by saying, you know, I have something that could be moved, All right, All right, she tested me, and I said, I did, what is it, and then she started teasing me. Uh, and I mean, we all joke about it, but in reality, sometimes mitzvahs can be not fun, <laughs> right? Mitzvahs are not necessarily fun to do, but be zealous to do it. I mean, when, when Loretta called, I mean, I was right in the middle of something, but at the same time, I was like, this is a great opportunity. But I wanted to do it myself, but I knew I couldn't. Exactly. I so can't. we all received a great merit for taking care yeah, of these families help. that yeah. needed our help. So. So, you know, look, there's sometimes, no, 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 I know, I know. Look, you can only do what you can do, okay? If you cannot perform it because you're physically not able to perform it, you cannot perform it, period. So you don't always have to say yes. And if you, pa if you don't have that mitzvah, you let Hashem know, I, I couldn't do that, but could you give me an opportunity to do another mitzvah, right? Or you can say, look, I can't do it, but I can call three or four people who can do it. I, so you participate in that mitzvah, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you did that for sure, and right? So, and so we did, but I think that can go for all, for all mitzvahs. Right, right. We used to, remember how we said, no, can't you come and do all that stuff? Right. In silence. Right, but yes. Another example of this last week, you know, how zeal took over with me. How zeal took over, yeah. yeah. If you need somebody to pick you up, why did I say that? I really don't know. Right. Right, but see, listen, but honestly. No, 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 that's not the case. That is not the case. That's not the case. That's not the case. So let, let me explain. So people that are watching can hear what you say, because it's a very good point. So Sandy says, uh, in response to that, what, you know, she had somebody that's going out of town. She said, if you need somebody to pick you up, give me a call. I'll, I'll come pick you up. But as soon as she said it, she was like, regret. Like, oh, I, why did I say that? So, right? It's an inconvenience to me. And is it a mitzvah then when you do it? Yes, if you do it with the intent of saying, yes, though I know it was inconvenient and it put me out. And it's a, it, I just di didn't have time. I still did it with joy, and I welcomed them back. Even though it was tiring, even exhausting, it still counts as a mitzvah. It's, it's, it's how you approach it. If you go there and you're schlopping up, and you're like, okay, I'll be there when I get there, you know, <laughs> and you open the door, you don't even talk to them, and they're like hinting, oh, we're hungry, we're famished. Like, get something to eat when you get to the house. I'm getting home. <laughs> I get that, but I'm still hoping they don't call. You're hoping they don't call, right, okay. Well, Hashem have mercy on you. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Ramahal takes this lesson to the next level, demonstrating that it is appropriate to employ Zerizus in all of one's uh, worthy actions. You will similarly find that all the actions of the righteous are consistently performed with this uh, very strong sense of dedication. Regarding the hospitality of Avraham, it is written, Avraham hastened to his tent to Sarah and said, hurry, etc. You know, be prepared, let's get prepared. He gave uh, the calf to the, to the youth and he hurried to prepare it regarding the act of kindness that Rivka performed. It is also written, she hurried and emptied her jug 
into the trough and kept running to the well to draw water. Scripture emphasizes repeatedly in each of these cases the urgency uh, uh, that characterized the action of these righteous individuals. Let's, let's for a second, I want to I drill down for just a moment the idea that waiting or delaying creates more misery to do the mitzvah. Right? And dreading. And then feeling guilty about it. And then avoiding it altogether the next time it comes around, right? Oftentimes, our pause to do a mitzvah because you realize it's going to be overwhelming, it's tiring, whatever it may be, when you're finished with it, you, you, you realize there was great reward in doing that, right? You, yeah, absolutely. In the end, you realize, you know, I drug myself up to this place and I, you know, went through the process and, you know, it was good. I, I enjoyed it. And I think what the Ramchal is getting to, that if you don't delay, as soon as you hear it, you know it's a mitzvah. And the reason why you know it's a mitzvah is you have watchfulness and you just go for it. You go for the gusto. You do it. In the end, you're going to feel better because you did do that. And, and look, I'm the worst guy to talk about physical exercise right now, okay? But the idea, we all know people who work out, they say that if working out, you cannot delay your workout. If you're going to do it, get on a schedule and stick to the schedule. And work that schedule on a daily basis because if you don't, you, it won't take long before you fall back into that routine. So it's the same thing. So performance of the mitzvah, zeal to do it, is, is part of the battle to keep from dread falling into it. And I tell you, once you miss several mitzvahs like this, it isn't long to where you won't even consider the mitzvah when it comes. You won't even think about it. it just When it comes, you, it just won't, it won't even cross your mind. You're like, let somebody else do it. It's too much trouble. That's that laziness that we were talking about. That's the laziness. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, because la laziness, laziness ultimately manifests itself to insensitivity. You just, you lose, you lose your watchfulness. Right. You lose your watchfulness. Yes, absolutely. Oh, by all means. By all means. I mean, so your, your incl evil inclination, you get to hurrah. It, it wants to rest. It wants to chill out. Mm -hmm. Right? And it doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, it's the great rationalizer, isn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when the scripture states that, that uh, Menach's wife, uh, the woman hastened, she ran and told her husband this teaches that all actions of the righteous are performed with this strong sense of obligation. Uh, let me read this. When the angel promises Menach's wife that she would have a son, she ran to tell her husband so that he would come and receive instruction from the angel regarding how to raise the child. Here, too, the scripture stresses that she hastened and ran. This incident brings to focus at the fact that Zerizus is warranted not only when coming to aid of hungry and thirsty travelers, where haste is important to relieve their suffering, as in the case of Avraham and Revka, but even when performing other worldly deeds. This explains why the righteous people mentioned above and others like them always acted with this strong sense of urgency. Their souls are indeed ablaze with enthusiasm and fervor to service of the Creator. Let's talk about now cultivating enthusiasm for the mitzvahs through Zerizus. Now, what is the opposite of enthusiasm? Laziness. Laziness comes not because you want to be lazy, but lazy comes because you don't want to be inconvenienced. You don't want to be put out. Right? If you're, if you're lying on the couch, everybody remembers this when you have kids. You lie on the couch, and you're laying there and you're relaxed, and you realize the remote is five feet away from you. <laughs> yeah, everybody's guilty of this, right? And you go, hey, can you get me the remote? And they're going, what? 
Why can't you get the remote? I'm just as far away from it than you are. And you go, that's why I had children. Okay, just get up and get it. You remember this. And we're laughing because we're all guilty of this. Enthusiasm. How can we see that a person whose soul is aflamed with enthusiasm is service is the service of his creator? Will certainly not be lethargic in the performance of his mitzvahs. Rather, this m- moment will be like a rapidly moving fire, as he will neither rest nor be still once he starts the mitzvah, until he brings this matter to completion. One of the things that I have found in the Jewish com- community in comparison to other communities, even religious communities. The Jewish community, especially in the Orthodox community, are very focused on, on, on doing the mitzvah. Um, you know, there are individuals in this community that I think of that on a regular basis go way out of their way to bring comfort and rest and peace to other people's lives. And, you know, I think of one individual who often will go to someone's house and bring baked goods to this person who knows that they're a single family, single parent, and they don't have time to bring, you know, make things like this for their children. And what a great, what a great mitzvah. Uh, this week I got calls from, from, um, from Rabbi Wobie, et cetera, uh, asking, hey, what are you doing for Shabbos for the worldwide event? And you're welcome to come stay with us. And I had to explain, we have our own community and we have events here that we'll need to be doing. But they're always looking to take care of somebody. I mean, people opening their houses for strangers. Can you imagine? We don't do this in our society anymore. They just open their doors and say, come on in, have a safe place to, to stay and a warm place and a warm bed and great time of study. It's an amazing deal. So, Just how is Zerazus in one's action is the product of, of the previously existing interblaze of enthusiasm. So too, such an inner blaze can be brought about by Zerazus. You develop Zerazus by acting on your zeal, right? Um, I, I used to... Uh, tell the, the kids when they were younger and when they become teenagers and it starts getting hard for them to wake up, you know, it's, and they're like, oh, it's like 12, I think 12 or 13, oh, I'm tired, I'm lethargic, sleepy. And I remember telling them, and hop right out of bed. I mean, as soon as you hear us, hop right out of bed. Get on your feet and you, you, you will get the energy and it'll be there. And once you develop the hot, habit of hopping out of bed, and each one of us, if, if you've learned this, it makes life so much easier. You know, hitting the snooze button is great, but doesn't help you hop out of bed, right? It just doesn't help you at all. And I, I think most of my children did pretty good. They didn't, they didn't have a problem. They're still early risers. But the point is, is it's, it, it builds an enthusiasm. A fire blaze is, is promoted by what? What promotes the growth of a fire? Kindling or wood or an accelerant and oxygen, right? How do we kindle the fire of Zerizus or enthusiasm and zeal to do mitzvah? Is by adding those two ingredients. Oxygen in our lungs and energy from our body together when we get and put it into action, we begin to develop it naturally and it becomes easier. You... You get excited about doing mitzvahs the more that you do. The less mitzvah you do, the less excited you get. I mean, it's just sort of a factor that is a natural factor. Uh, I used to see this commercial. It kind of annoyed me, but it said, uh, a, a body in motion is a body that tends to stay in motion. And it used to annoy me because I'm like, duh. It's not a big revelation, okay? But they were treating it as if it was some newly released scientific study. Right? The idea of body at motion tends to stay in motion. Well, that's true. A corpse is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> right? And, and so to have this energy, we have, to, we have to push the train down the tracks. You have to put the right property or the right fuel in. Where does this fuel come from? The fuel first comes from study of Torah, hid the debut, personal prayer. It is the increase of your amuna, your faith. 
And in the process of all of that, having extreme zeal to make sure that you do your mitzvah, right? So whenever you hear it, somebody says, hey, you know, can you do me this favor? Or can you do this? Or you know that you see something else that you can do in Torah, maybe another level of, 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 of kashrut or, or, or um, kosher in your life that you never realized that you could do, jump on it. Don't waste time. Do it. Figure out a way to make it happen. And then you're going to have your life transformed or changed. This means that when someone energizes himself in his performance of a mitzvah, then just as he quickens his outer movement, so too does he cause his inner movement to be fired up within. Thus, through the putting on Zerzus into practice, the yearning and the desire to perform the mitzvah will grow continually stronger within, which in turn will lead to more Zerzus. However, the converse is also true. If one is sluggish in the movement of his limbs and to perform mitzvahs uh, uh, lethargically, um, then, then the movement of his spirit, the inner man, diminishes, will also diminish and will eventually become extinguished. This is something to which um, a, a, a experience can attest. The Ramchal elaborates upon the importance of the, the performing a mitzvah with enthusiasm and reiterates that the trait can be cultivated. Why you already, now you already know that what is the most favored in the service of the Creator, blessed be His name, is the desire of one's heart to fulfill His will and the longing of one's soul to, uh, close, for closeness with Him. This is what David Hamelech, Hamelech refers when he applauds his good lot and says, as a deer calls upon the, long, uh, the longingly for a brook of water, so does my soul, soul longingly to you, O God, my soul thirst for God. And when he exclaims, my soul yearns and indeed it pines for the courtyards of Hashem. And when he declares, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a parched and thirsty land with no water. However, with respect to the person in whom his favor does not yet burn properly, a helpful suggestion for him is that he should conscience, consciously choose to act with Zerizus, so that as a result of this external excitement, interfervor, and for mitzvah will develop in his nature. For as he has stated, lively external movement of the body inspires the comparable inter-enthusiasm of the spirit. So what is the answer to having more excitement and enthusiasm for doing mitzvah? Act like it. I love that statement. Everybody say it together. Fake it till you make it. Do what? Well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. That's very good. Very good. Thing. So, so one person in the class says, well, is that a lying impression? You know, you smile. You really don't feel like smiling. When we make our bodies do what it doesn't want to do, it eventually will affect the inter, inter uh, qualities of the human body. Right. 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 One of the things Rebbe Nachman says in, in, in part of what you just said about impressing on the Yetzer Tov uh, or helping the Yetzer Tov grow by doing those things is he says a person that has depression should sing and dance. <laughs> it's like, right. how do you get a depressed person to sing and dance? Well, the whole point, if the person realizes that the key to his exiting out of the bondage of his depression is to sing and dance, he, if you could get him to do it, play pleasant music, what, what, what do most people do when depression comes on? You isolate yourself, you dwell on it, you get in a dark room, 
you sink deeper and deeper. Uh, you sleep a lot. You, whatever you have to do to hide away from it. And the sages of blessed memory tell us very clearly, fake it till you make it. That means if you're depressed, act joyous, sing songs, dance, you know, sing tunes, welcome people. How are you doing? And deep down inside, you feel like crawling in a hole. Listen, it's not true. It, put on the garments of praise. Uh, put on the garments of praise, yes. And that is the whole point. So it, you know, in, in many aspects, that in and of itself becomes a mitzvah. Why? Because you're telling Hashem, deep down inside as a human being, I am messed up. I'm hurting. I'm, I'm, I'm in anguish. I have anxiety and depression. But Hashem, because you are Hashem, and you have designed my life, I am going to be a, a servant that is respectable around you, and I'm going to show zeal. Can you imagine a servant around a king coming like, I'm so depressed. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> like, what would the king do? Banish you out of his chamber. He wouldn't let you in his chamber. But a servant goes beyond his illnesses, goes beyond his emotional state, goes beyond what's going on with his family and his children's life, and that servant comes in and says, Master, how can I serve you? He's got a smile on his face. He's cleaned. He's prepared. So this whole idea of Zerizus, or zeal to serve the king, is just like a servant working in the household of his master, a great king. And that servant comes in, and he might have family problems. His back might be sore from the days before labor. He Do what? His fam yeah, maybe his family's under really tough financial strain, but he sees the king come in in all of his regal splendor, and he realizes he is a humble king. He's a beautiful king. He's a king that loves his people. And when he comes in, he's not going to come before the king all long-faced, drawn out, because he wants to match the splendor of his king. He wants to match the splendor of his master. So why do we have Zerizus? So why do we want to develop the trait of Zerizus? It's because it puts us in optimal performance to stand before the master as his servant. And we get up in the morning when, when it's time to get up. The first thing is not, oh, I really put some coffee in, you drink, you're half asleep. You don't do the Shema. You don't thank Hashem for the good rest. You don't thank Him for returning your soul in you. Well, th that's not Zerizus. Zerizus is a zeal. You wake up and it's two in the morning and you're excited because you think, wow, I get to say my first Shema. And you go, oh, it's still two. I have time to sleep. Can you, still say well, you can if you're going to get up. Yeah, but I'm saying if you're not going to get up, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, oh, wow, I woke up. So it's the idea of getting up and you go, oh, it's, it's, uh, ooh, it's 3.30. If I, I can listen to a lecture before I get up, right? And when you don't do it, and I'm telling you right now, practice makes perfect. When you don't do it, you won't do it. And when you don't do it, you won't do it, you won't feel like doing it. And the only way to reverse that is to wake up and make yourself do it. All right? It's, it's that whole saying, you know what? I'm going to fake it till I make it. It's a beautiful thing. We please Hashem. Correct. So, right. Right. So, so here's the thing. There is a fine line between lacking the enthusiasm, but yet having the zeal to go ahead and do it. Okay? Because what the Ramchal is saying if one acts upon his zeal, his Zerizus, enthusiasm will develop. It will burn like a fire. At first, we will often act in zeal before we really have the enthusiasm, right? But it's all right as long as you get the, comp the task done, that you've completed it with watchfulness, you've completed the task, even though you didn't have all the enthusiasm to do it. Because one of the things we learn as adults, you do things that you don't necessarily like to do. Pay taxes, you know, pay your house note. <laughs> yeah, jury duty. Don't even mention that. But yes, go ahead. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Right. Real food. Correct. 
Correct. So, so that, that I believe, Sandy, is what ails the, those who really would like to draw closer to Hashem. Mm-hmm. They desire it, but they're, it's like the person who's, uh, who's unhealthy because of their eating habits. They would like to be healthy. But, well, right, but they, they also don't want the, the um, and I'm talking about a person who's not healthy. A lot of times when you're not healthy, you tend to eat worse food because you're trying to get that temporary, what do you call it, uh, energy fix that comes from empty carbs, right? No, they don't know. Because listen, we... This country has a huge population of people that are on, food, are on food assistance programs, right? These are people who are considered poor. These are people who are considered poor, right? But yet they're obese. Does that make sense to you? They're eating empty calories. They're eating junk, right? Right, they're eating filler foods. So the idea is spiritually this can be applied, and this is, you know, I think as, as we are as a nation, so as we are spiritually. What we have as a nation, the majority of people are looking to fulfill the inner, inner person by empty, by, by empty emotionalism, empty experiences, whatever it may be. And it keeps, them, yeah, it keeps them high for a little while, but the problem is it inflates the ego. And the ego never does the Hashem's will in the end. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. By eating, right. 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 Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it is. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so the key to, to all of this, and this is such, and once again, Ramchal said it in the beginning, I'm not going to tell you anything that you're not going to recognize as you already know. Okay, we understand this. Bottom line is, you're not going to have zeal for Hashem to do righteous acts. And following all the gamut, from study of Torah to taking care of the poor, you're not going to have zeal if you don't do it. And if, you, if you're saying, well, I just, the problem is, is that's just not me. Have you ever heard, felt that expression? That, this is just not me to do this mitzvah. It's all right. Somebody else is just not me. Then the answer to it is start doing it, and it will become you, and you'll be, have zeal to do it. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, you've got that. You go to the table, like Sandy was saying. You go to the table, and you taste of it. Some don't taste. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. So, what is that? Why is it that some don't taste the nutrition or the nurturing of the mitzvah? Uh, I believe that it comes from what I said. Yeah. I believe what it comes from the, uh, the other. Let's use the food analogy and nutrition. A person who eats empty calories right. become morbidly obese and yet they're unhealthy. Right. And if you put good food in front of them, they have no desire for it because they're stuffed from their empty calories. What does the stuff represent to me? This is my, my thing that I'm yeah. going to say. It's ego. It's inflated, inflated ego. So when a person spiritually imbibes in a uh, world of spiritual spirituality that is in empty emotionalism and empty uh, empty experiences what ends up happen happening is that person has an inflated ego and so when they see the Torah and the nutrition of the Word of God and the living word of life they look at it and go eh, I'm satisfied with my experience right Mm-hmm. Quick. Right. 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 Right.
Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You have a feast and it nurtures the body. It builds a fire so you desire more of that good food. They don't want to put the effort out. And why, why don't they want to put the effort out? The reason, and I said this. Uh, there, there, yeah, yeah, there, there is a, yeah, the, yeah, the idea is that uh, emotionalism and spiritual experiences uh, stir up the Yetzirah, not the Yetzirah, right? And so what people do is they like to have the spirit, they like to have spirituality without the obligation of having a relationship with Hashem. Right? They, they love the, yeah, they love the you know, feel good teachings. They love, you know, if you're, if you're new age, they love the crystals. They like, you know, having the pray in the pyramid, meditate in the pyramid. They like the experiential things and it inflates their ego to such a place that they feel like I'm sated because I'm satisfied because I get to have this spiritual experience without all the obligation. What they don't realize is they're like the morbidly obese person that's crumbing their face full of food, getting fat, and have no nurture, nurture, but technically, and, uh, nutrition. They're calling it spiritual, but it's really physical. It is physical. So it's more yeah, physical. What, what they're calling spirituality is really it's emotionalism. Really a, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but okay, that's that's true. So, let, let, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Betty, Betty says that we uh, Hashem gives us the physical connection, but the the experiential is the byproduct of our mitzvah. The other hand is they want to bypass the mitzvah for the experiential. Okay. So. You know, when we look at, for example, as much as we like cheese curls and Cheetos and all those things, they're not technically food, even though we call them food in society, right? They're, they're really not food. I mean, compare that to uh, broccoli. Broccoli's food. It gives you energy. But what Cheetos does is it does give you a jolt of energy. It does give you an experience of food, but it's really not food. And so the idea is the mitzvahs that we perform in our life, these ultimately give us the, the greatest level of spiritual experience. And we all know this in this room. And we try to explain that to people, and they go, oh, I know, but I still get my spiritual experience through what I do. And what they don't realize, it's empty calories. It's empty energy. It's empty spirituality. And you hate to say that, but the facts are the fact. It is empty spirituality. I know a lot of people that are really very, very, that they perform a lot of mitzvahs without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. And they still refuse to. Right. You know what I mean? They're, they're givers and they're charitable mm -hmm. and right. all that. But they still have that thing that they just can't get away from. Right. Right. So that's the difference. Yeah, but they do. But they're. What I'm saying though is they're doing it in, in a false premise. They, right. They really believe they're doing it for God. Because in the and, and I, mean, I know men. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, what they think. Yeah, I know. Well, they they, 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 they they listen. They they might be doing it unto God. It's just we don't a know. Hard, hard thing. It's but a fine line that I have. But the question is: Is is a mitzvah? Okay. Now here's the question. Is a mitzvah a mitzvah if it's not done the way Hashem says to do it? No, you're supposed to do what Hashem says. It's not a mitzvah. Says. Yeah, you're supposed to do it. It's not a mitzvah. No, if you don't know, that's what I'm saying. That might be different, okay? That, that's, that's different. And they're doing it with the... Okay, so let's... I, I, I honestly... I honestly... Yeah, but I honestly don't know the full answer to that. I do believe that they receive some credit for it, mm -hmm. but it would be like, and I, I, metaphor is how I see things. 
It'd be like me going out and saying, I'm going to do a, a kind act for my wife. I'm going to change her tire. But I don't follow the manufacturer's way to change a tire. It's got five lugs. Why do you need five? One's good enough. Did I change your tire? Yes. But you didn't do it properly. But I didn't do it properly. And is it really, did I actually help her by changing her tire? I guess the point is, right. So, but, but the point yeah, is. Maybe that's what it takes. It's going to take it to fall off. In order to get them to realize, right? But this is right. this is what this is what Rabbi Weiss was talking about Tuesday night when he was saying exactly. that, you know, for for example, for Sukkot, you, you build a sukkah that's to your own standards, like you want. You know, I I, I decide I want it to be uh, made out of cinder blocks with a plastic roof. Yeah, you put the roof. Okay, right. you didn't make a mitzvah. You you just built a cinder block house with a plastic roof. Okay. And to say, I'm going to now do the mitzvah of a bracha in the sukkah. Mm -hmm. You didn't do a bracha in the sukkah. You didn't do a mitzvah. So the whole point is, why do it? Don't, don't do it if you're not going to do it according to his standards. But their heart was thinking that they were doing that. That's true. And that's what I, where that's I what cannot I tell you. I that's, that's, where where that's where Hashem has to decide. That's what I'm saying. That's right. the hard part. No, no, we, we can't, I'm not going to judge it, I'm not going to judge it, but if that person were to come to you and say, Betty, I decided to build a sukkah in my garage, no, that's, it's, no, what you tell them, it's not a sukkah, it's a, it's a, you're camping in your garage, it's not a sukkah. Correct, you never put it down. And you build it for it, you use it as an excuse to have a pavilion outside. And so at that point, then they become aware of right. what they're doing wrong. Right, but if you don't know, you don't know, okay? Well, no, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. I right. Yes. No, we have a plan to build the...